Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and though my guest today and I didn't start doing programs together at this table until 20 years ago, his has been a name and a reputation to conjure with in American law enforcement, and for many more years than that. Indeed, Robert M. Morgenthau was appointed United States Attorney for the premier Southern District of New York by President John F. Kennedy, stayed there nearly a decade then became Manhattan's distinguished district attorney more than a quarter century ago. In 2001, my guest was re-elected DA once again, this time with no opposition. Of course, both pride and full disclosure lead me to note that my son and my daughter-in-law are both assistant DAs in the Morgenthau office. But now, looking back to the aftermath of the horrendous September 11, 2001 terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, we find, shockingly enough, that my guest still had to argue for cutting off funds for terror, part of the crusade against money laundering he has waged so vigorously for so many years now. Indeed, in late October 2001, Mr. Morgenthau still felt constrained to write in a New York Times op-ed piece we are at a critical juncture in the fight to cut off the funding for Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda network and other terrorist groups. The danger is that this badly needed money laundering legislation may be killed by potent special interests, including the American Bankers Association, that oppose it. They are keeping a low profile but their tactic is to separate the money laundering provision from others and then stall them to death. If that happens, the government will be deprived of a powerful weapon in this fight. That didn't happen. But now I want to ask my guest how in the world this opposition to money laundering could possibly exist given the terror around us. And when I say opposition to money laundering, I mean opposition to the many times the district attorney has attempted to get legislation necessary to end it. How can you account for that, Mr. District Attorney? Well, I mean, one of the things is that money laundering is a, is a complicated and sophisticated business, so a lot of people don't understand it. And when people don't understand things, it's easier to, to push them aside. But we first became aware of problems in the Middle East when we when we prosecuted Frank Turple, who was a rogue CIA agent and was providing explosives to not only to Palestinians but other radical elements in, in the Middle East. And then of course with BCCI we uh, we came across it again. But what what we found out was that to run these operations of course a significant amount of money. I mean, early on, the papers were saying, oh, this was all done on the cheap, and there was only a few thousand dollars here and a few thousand dollars there. But to maintain a, a private army, and that's what and that's what Bin Laden has, and also to bribe the host um, countries and pay for their private army costs a lot of money. And and the the best estimate that that we had from from Arab sources, and, and we developed those sources uh, uh, during the BCCI investigation, that it cost $35, $40 million to equip those troops, um, 
to take care of their families, to, to buy ammunition, and to take care of the network uh, throughout uh, uh, Europe and the Middle East and, and, and the United States. So you can't keep that kind of money in shoeboxes. Uh, you've got to use the, the banking system. And uh, that's why I thought this legislation was so important, because we had a we have some transparency in what's going on. That's a kind of a, a fancy word, but in other words, openness. You had to know who the people were that were contributing and how they were moving their money. Because there are a lot of so-called respectable Saudi leaders uh, who were supporting bin Laden, perhaps out of fear, stay out of Saudi Arabia and we'll give you money, perhaps other motives. but. If this was going to be exposed, if people were going to know who the ones were that were contributing, I thought that in itself would cut off a significant amount of money. And, and if you could cut his funds by 50 percent, instead of getting 30, raising 35, 40 million dollars a year, 15 to 20, uh, that in itself would have a major impact because. Oh, he's got a lot of fanatics with him. Probably the bulk of his troops in the Taliban are mercenaries. If they don't get paid, they're not gonna they're not gonna stay with him. So that's why exposing the whole financial setup was extremely important. But who could possibly disagree with that? Well, I mean, it's a uh, there are two groups of, of people that could disagree. One, those who who benefit by uh, offshore. I mean, there's $80 billion on deposit in the Cayman Islands. $80 billion. On I mean, the, I'm, I'm sorry. $800 billion. $800 billion. On that tiny island? On that tiny island with 35,000 people. And that is two and a half times as much as is on deposit in, in all the banks in New York City. I mean, and it's been growing about seventy, eighty billion dollars a year. So pretty soon, if you want to cash your paycheck, you're going to have to go down to the Cayman <laughs> Islands to get the dollars. Um, and, and why is it there? It's there because uh, uh, for tax evasion and, and tax avoidance. Um, so that there are all those people, and, and they can have lobbying groups that are getting their money out of the Caymans, and nobody knows who they are, and they can talk about, you know, invasion of privacy and all kinds of. Arguments, uh, and and we don't know who they are and who's supporting. The other uh, group, of course, are people who make their money by getting deposits and then lending it out. You mean bankers? Bankers. Uh, our bankers. Our bankers. I mean, I remember back a few years when we were serving subpoenas on one of the major banks to get records involving drug trafficking. And um, uh, he asked me to come over and have coffee and see if we could work something out so we weren't serving so many subpoenas. And I saw all these uh, people, mostly men, uh, walking by wearing gold goal posts. And I said, you know, these are the people who won the football pool? What is this? He said, no, those are the people who made their goal on deposits this past month. So you were get, you're assigned a quota, maybe it's $5 million. Um, and if you get that, meet that goal, then you get to wear a gold goalpost, and your boss sees that you're one of the producers. No matter what the source. Unfortunately, the the fewer questions asked, the more likely to get the deposits, and that's one of the things that this legislation does. It requires banks to know their depositors. It will prevent banks from acting as correspondent for so-called shell banks, just a bank that somebody sits down on their computer and organizes it. Caymans advertise on their website, we have 600 banks chartered here. This is Cayman Islands speaking. 600 banks chartered here, and 100 actually have a physical presence. So that means 500 are just nameplates. But if they get an open an account with a with an American bank, um, then people can run money through that shell bank and through the American bank, and, and nobody knows who they are. So that's why 
it's important to find out and to require the banks to find out who the customers are. Now, in late October th 2001, six weeks after the bombings, six weeks after the destruction of the World Trade Center, you had to write that op-ed piece in the New York Times. Legislation still had not accomplished what you wanted accomplished. <clears throat> Why? Now, you, you talk about what the interest of the bank, of a particular bank or many banks may be. What was the reason that there was this delay in the Congress of the United States? You know, the Senate was, was fully on board, and there was an element in the House that was opposed. Uh, fortunately, Senator Sarbanes, who's the chairman of um, uh, Senate Banking, uh, Senator Levin, who's the chairman of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, uh, dug in their heels and said, no bill is going to pass on terrorism unless it contains any money laundering provisions. And, and, and they prevailed. Where was the opposition from? The opposition was from a, a, a group um, in the House, in the House of Representatives. And I, I don't want to characterize it, but because, um, uh, you know, when, when when you're successful, then you say, listen, everything's okay. But um, it, it, this group in the House had stalled this legislation for almost two years, actually. Well, now you say stalled for almost two years. It took bin Laden then. Uh, it took the World Trade Center then to accomplish what you had been trying to accomplish for much longer than two years. Yes, that's right. That's, that's absolutely right. But I, I think... You know, I think it's already having an impact. I think that, that when people know that their financial support of terrorism is going to be disclosed, um, that's going to have an impact, and that's going to cut off some of the purse strings. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of these, dis you know, desertions and, and, and people leaving is because they're not being paid or they don't think they're going to be paid. Uh what was the rationale? I, I understand what you say about in victory be magnanimous. Don't go after the birds who were opposing the legislation you know we needed. But what was their rationale? What were the arguments offered to oppose the legislation that you <clears throat> needed? Uh, Free speech? Uh, Let us do it. Invasion of, of privacy or your. You want to find out about um, people's source of income. But, I mean, my position is that, and the people who supported the bill, is that, that uh, people who have offshore accounts are not entitled to any greater degree of privacy than American citizens. Uh, nor are they entitled to um, pay less than in taxes than mandated by law by the Congress of the United States. I mean, some people said, well, this was a, a move to, to raise taxes and that people were afraid of tax comp competition. That was absolutely full. I mean, I don't enjoy paying my taxes, but it makes me mad as hell, frankly, to know that there are a lot of people out there that are not paying any taxes while you and I and everybody else who has a job um, is paying their taxes. So it's a question of fairness. Uh, as well as uh, a question of, of discouraging illegal use. We, we, uh, we ran a sting operation, um, and actually our officers were in the World Trade Center. We, we ran a money management firm, and uh, we were collecting. This was the summer, and we, we closed that operation down largely in the end of August. But uh, we, got, we were in building number two, and we got taken out along with everybody else. Um, what we found was we would take cash and then send it through the banking system to places that the drug dealers want to send it. Um, and we sent it to over 300 different banks and organizations around the world. So we got a pretty good list of, of, of the banks that um, and, and other brokerage firms were taking money. But there was one that, 
that caught my eye particularly because it, it turned out to be a, a very large insurance company and, and a, a subsidiary of a very large insurance company and it had a, a, a well-known um, mutual fund advisor, well-known American one, as part of their company. And so what you could do is you could send cash, and it was chartered in one of the offshore jurisdictions. You could send your money there, and then you could, then you could invest in an American mutual fund. And one of the things they, they bragged about is that you don't pay any taxes. And, and in their brochure, and this is a big outfit, in their brochure is saying, we, we look for customers who are, who are international players, and expatriates. Nice way of saying we're looking for, we're offering our services to people who, who don't want to pay the taxes. You know, uh, I know that yours is the most distinguished district attorney office in, in the United States. I don't say that because of my son and daughter-in-law. Everyone knows that uh, Morgenthau's uh, Manhattan DA's office is, and yet the question has come up so many times. Why is it that Morgenthau has to pursue these matters that seem to be national, uh, on a national scale, rather than the federal government? And I have the opportunity now to put the question to you. Why? Well, I think one of the, one of the advantages that we have is that we're immune to political pressures. Um, I mean, I remember when we, when we tried to subpoena um, a senior uh, Saudi official who was also a, a director of BCCI, but to get him to come over here, we had to go through Justice Department, State Department, American Embassy in Riyadh uh, to have them serve the subpoena. And the word came back, American Embassy, State Department, Justice Department, us, no such person can be located in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. About three weeks uh, later, this sheikh's lawyer came in to see me, very distinguished lawyer, uh, and said, um, I would like free passage from my client to go to the Mayo Clinic. He has a problem that he wants uh, the Mayo Clinic to examine, and uh, I'd like an understanding that he will not be arrested when he comes to go to the Mayo Clinic. And he said, you know, he wouldn't steal money. He said uh, he's worth about 350 to $400 million. He has a palace that covers a square block in Riyadh. He supports the finest museum in Riyadh, which covers two square blocks. Uh, he has a palace almost as big in, in, uh, in, in Cairo, and, and he has another smaller palace in, in Casablanca. He's what we call well off. So I said to him, well, that's very interesting. I said, can you explain to me why the American embassy in Riyadh couldn't locate him? Well, he, for about 15 seconds, and he, he, he was from Oklahoma, and he said, well, it's kind of like the sheriffs in Oklahoma. Uh, you know, sometimes they're not as diligent as they ought to be. But all I'm, so, I mean, the bottom line is here, the American government, for its own political reasons, uh, the United States government did not want us to serve a subpoena on this prominent Saudi. I gather when you say political reasons, this is a um, another way of saying policy reasons. Right, not not, not Democrat Republican, because the same problem under under Democrat and Republican administration. Yeah, policy policy reasons. I mean, I could give you a whole bunch of those examples. Some of them quite quite amusing. Um, so that, uh, but we have that advantage because you know the the federal government can say, you know, we can't control that crazy guy up there in New York. Whereas if it's the United States attorney, you know, they can say, hey, that's forbidden. I mean, they will not let 
the Justice Department won't let the United States Attorney serve subpoenas on any foreign account without getting the approval of the Justice Department. That's why Jefferson had a good, a good idea when, uh, when he provided for the independence of, of uh, state and local authorities, subject, of course, to overwhelming national interest. Do you find it that you frequently thumb your nose at Washington? Oh, I would never do that. Put it another way, any way you want. Do you find yourself in that kind of conflict very often? From time to time, um, uh, particularly when we uh, start looking at international uh, transactions. But, but I think even though if we're not successful, uh, I think it's important because it, it lets people know that um, somebody's looking at illegal transactions. I mean, uh, we just recently done a case against a, uh, a fund called the Evergreen Fund, where they took investors, mostly in, in southeastern states of, of over $200 million. They, they told them, uh, you know, you'll pay their alleged headquarters were in Nassau and the Bahamas. Uh, they said, you'll pay no U.S. taxes. We guarantee you a return of 10 to 15 percent a year. Uh, and, they, and they took a lot of money from a lot of, you know, gullible people. And uh, we we went down there, and we were able to come back with, without getting arrested, with uh, you know 44 boxes of of records. And and then one of the principals was here in New York, who stole 30 million dollars, and we and we got an indictment against him, and we we have him still in in jail because he he could flee with the the money he took. So that those kind of things go on quite f frequently, and, and I mean, uh, our objective is to make people feel safe in investing in, in, in uh, American securities. And uh, it's also, we want people to feel safe in investing in New York. And that's important to the economy of the city and the state and of the nation. Now, uh, are you going to find that the legislation that was recently passed and that you wanted so much and that bin Laden helped you obtain, are you going to find that that works for you in terms of mafia and other international uh, activities? It's, it's going to help the federal government more than it's going to help state and local authorities. But that's good. I mean, uh, if, if we had had our druthers, uh, there would have been provisions in there to enable state and local prosecutors to get some of these records. But the important thing is it helps the United States in, in a very significant way. And uh, we, we'll, uh, we'll tag along. It does not help us as, as much as it helps the federal government. Now, I know we just have a few minutes left that after the World Trade Center matter of September 11th, there was a lot in the press about um, not necessarily conflict, though that too, but failure to exchange information between the federal authorities and New York City authorities, the police and the FBI. Is that a problem that you face too? I mean, I think it's a, it's a problem that law enforcement faces throughout the country. I mean, you may have seen that the the police commissioner of, of Baltimore said, you know, there are 650,000 state and local police officers and there are 11,500 FBI agents. You know, they got to tell us who they're looking for and, and, uh, uh, and, and we can help in a significant way. And, and, the, and the mayor here has said, you know, the, the FBI has got to be more forthcoming uh, with its information, and uh, uh, not that the FBI's job is, is a simple one, it's a, it's a very difficult one these days, but there's legislation 
pending now, which will authorize more sharing of information, and, and that's important. You say legislation pending, but isn't this a cultural matter, the culture of the FBI going back to J. Edgar Hoover? It's both, but, but I mean, they can, they can point to provisions of the law which make it, which justify not sharing. So it, it um, uh, I, I think some legislation will be, uh, w will be helpful. Uh, I mean, I, I have a you know, high regard for the new director of the FBI, Mueller, and um, I've talked to him several times, and, and I'm sure that, you know, that he wants to work with local law enforcement. It's just going to take a little time to, to work it out. In about a minute remaining, you were just reelected. You're going to be district attorney forever. What is the area now that you're going to consider most important to focus upon? Well, I mean, there, there, are two, there are two areas. Number one, you know, we've got to help root out terrorist cells that are here in New York. And even though that's a primary federal responsibility, it's also our responsibility. And the second is we want to keep people living in New York and we want to keep business in New York. Uh, so we're going to put a lot of effort into, into the drug traffic, which is all, still a major source of crime in New York City. When you were here last time, we talked about the drug traffic. You were very optimistic at the time that we were going to lick this problem. Are you still? Yes, and it's much better now. I mean, and, and murders in Manhattan are down by 85% since I've been the district attorney. Where we were number one in the city, we're now number four in terms of numbers of murders. So, yes, I am optimistic, but you, you, know, you can't sit back and congratulate yourself. You, you've got to keep plugging. Bob Morgenthau, I can't imagine you ever sitting back and just congratulating yourself. Thank you again for joining me on The Open Mind. No, thank you for asking me. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And if you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or a money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.